Hello YouTube, this is the Irritated Asian and I am back, baby! If you're new to my channel, first of all, welcome. And second, I haven't posted in a pretty long time. So for those of you who have stuck around with me, thank you for your support. And you all know that this is way overdue. Now if you couldn't tell already, I'm going to be playing as Mao Zedong, the communist dictator of China in hopes of bringing about the early rise of the People's Republic of China in the Middle Ages. Disclaimer. Actions, comments, references, or any other content present in this video are expressed sarcastically and do not accurately reflect my views or the history of Mao Zedong and the People's Republic of China. This video is not an endorsement, tacit or otherwise, of the views and policies of Mao Zedong or the Chinese Communist Party. While I do lean politically to the left, I do not support the authoritarian regimes of the CCP its leadership, or other communist governments that currently exist. Now before we begin this video, don't forget to hit that like button and all the little accessories down there if you support what I'm doing with this channel. And leave your thoughts, questions, and concerns down in the comment section below. Now without further ado, let's get right into the video and see how we do in this game of Communist Kings 3. Our story will begin here in the county of Bayan, outside of the great capital of Beijing. Mao Zedong has been reincarnated into his young self of 21. Ambitious, cynical, and stubborn, he is but an intelligent, talented military commander. And of course, the first thing he must do is get a wife. Although many people do not appreciate his lack of faith, though he may be Confucian and Buddhist by teaching. He still finds, however, a loyal, ish wife in Huang who does not dislike him completely. In domestic affairs, getting good and able military commanders is key, as well as establishing the Chinese culture in Bayan. The Che who live there do not agree with this Mao's radicalized thinking, for they believe in their own ways of tribal authorities. So we must also teach them away from their culture and their religion. Of course, atheism is by no means the same in this game as it is in real life, because this one is led by Mao Zedong. Things are shunned, not necessarily banned, because it's some people's rights, and with this there will be no holds barred for Mao to expand his influence across Manchuria and China. In foreign affairs, Mao's first move is to take advantage of Hiyashu's weakness to take it from the tribes of Che. To aid in this, with his son Zheng Lun having been born, he decides to seek an alliance with the tribe of Ganxian. Yet it all seems useless, as Hiyashi was easily defeated in its first battle, and Mao has claimed the region. With the growth of his family, Mao decides to establish traditions for House Mao, one based on knowledge, to ensure that all know the true great government that is communism. And as it would seem, neighboring forces are looking to Mao as a potential threat or an ally, with the Khan of Kitan seizing on the moment to create an alliance between him and Mao ensuring that Mao's eastern front is secure so that he may target Qi Binga in the south with its very weak forces or attack instead Sadanor in the north who seems to be just as weak. In preparations for these invasions, he remembers his time with his guerrilla fighters knowing that they must forage on the land for their own supplies. While he also learns from his current battles in Hiyashu to become a truly talented leader in many respects. So he begins his first campaign, targeting Sadenor in the north. And just like with Hiyashu, he decimates the enemy forces and besieges Sadenor's capital of Dashwipo, bringing the war to a very quick end in less than a year. With his power steadily increasing, Mao decides to clean house ensuring that very disloyal courtiers are not placed in positions of power, instead promoting those who are talented, but also look at him in good faith. Nanye Sungye is not one of those people, and loses his position as steward to the more capable and loyal Chen Jiegu. Yet Mao's ambition does not stop there. He decides now to target the weak Dayan, bordering his new territory of Sadanor, amassing his forces and leading it personally, he seeks to bring the people out of the suffering of the tribal lord of Dayan. Another fast and flawless victory in Mao Zedong's pocket. And Mao's bloodlust now points 
to Degare. Allied with a small county in the Ningzhou region enabling them, he seeks to take them by surprise. Meanwhile, he takes his time to establish his authority further by creating the Zhou of Hege, although it won't be a Zhou for long. Yet another military victory for Mao Zedong. However, he does seem a bit overextended, and so he'll have to give up one of his territories to be governed by another of his courtiers, and as any communist knows, first reward the military. That means Bagari Dai is the new lord of Dayan. Yet all are not accepting of the sudden change of communism. The people, surely fanned by the dark money of the aristocracy, have risen up against Mao's new communist government. Of course, Mao must use his military force of the People's Red Army to suppress this revolt before others join them, and they are easily brought to heel. But instead of treating them as he would in his old life of execution and purging, Mao has learned better to incorporate the talented leaders of the people to gain the people's trust, as well as to bolster his own forces. With his people seemingly at peace, Mao once again turns to conquest, trying to attack the neighboring region of Ningzhou. Unfortunately, it would seem as he has gotten a little bit ahead of himself, as the Tatar Tengrists are opposed to his atheistic beliefs, standing opposed to him while his army is away trying to take away Ningzhou. Mao of course will not stand for this, and shall send his forces to deal with them post haste. As if his situation couldn't get any worse, he is now attacked by Teddy Khan, seeking to take advantage of his disorder and take Dayan away from his territory. Mao seems to have found himself in quite the pickle. Mao's first targets are the Tengrists, who are very small in number. After their defeat, he decides to move with his allies to attack the Teddy Khan forces trying to move through the south. Mao then conducts a cat and mouse operation against the Teddy Khan forces in and around the Tang region, soon catching his allies in the rear guard with his own allies and completely destroys them, chasing the Teddy Khan forces all the way to Dayan, where he deals them a heavy defeat as well. While this is all happening, however, the Ningzhou force of 600 men are attacking the capital in Beiyan. And so, after chasing them out into Tang territory, the Mao army defeats them as well. Just in time for another Tengris uprising from the K, which goes just about as well as the last Tengris uprising, which didn't go well at all. While suppressing the religious rebels, raiders try to take advantage of the situation and raid in Beiyan as well. Of course, Mao does not see fit to leave them as is and decides to march to defeat his enemies all somehow coalescing around Xinhua, first against the raiders and then against the forces in Ningzhou. During this time, Mao's wife sadly passes away and he must seek a new wife. Just for an alliance, it's for an alliance, I swear. As for the Teddy Khan threat, after the battle of Dashui Po, the Mao forces in the Red Army sees a decisive victory, getting some war operations and now refocusing their effort on their original war and goal, the conquest of Ningzhou. In a last ditch effort, Ningzhou tries to besiege Xinhua once again, but finds himself defeated yet again in the Tang territory of Jizhou, solidifying Mao's victory over the region with the capture of their lord. With a sense of peace, Finally restored, Mao takes this time to reorganize his territory. No longer is this the simple duchy of Heje. In fact, it is becoming the People's Heje, as it truly belongs to the communist populace that Mao has brought to the forefront of the Middle Ages. Around all of southern Manchuria, this is but the beginning of his conquest. Sizing up his new foreign affair borders, Mao realizes that his greatest threat is perhaps the Kyrgyz Khanate to the west, seeing them in the territory of what he has remembered as the USSR. He sends his spy master to obtain some secrets to get some sort of advantage over the Khagan and his vassals. Of course, Mao shouldn't be working all the time and decides to show off his physical attributes by going on a hunt in Beiyan. Marching off into the mountains with some of his close retainers, he decides to hunt a wolf to show his truly ferocious demeanor. 
he spots the wolf with his men and rides after it. And with the minimal success, he catches up and decides, of course, to take the shot himself, aiming a beautiful shot and getting some wolf fang for himself, proving that he is truly a man among men. Meanwhile, Mao's spymaster is able to discover that the Kagan is in fact a witch, something that the Tengri believers shun and despise, meaning that the Kagan will do anything to hide the secret, including marrying off his daughter to Mao's son. And with this, Mao has secured the western border against the Kagan raids, letting him focus again on Manchuria. Speaking of which, Mao decides to annex Chongchun, formerly Ningzhou, into his territory. Unfortunately during this time, Mao discovers that the Kagan has passed away, leaving his son in charge, who does not seek an alliance at all. But he seems to be dealing with his own issues at the moment. Chongchun quickly falls, and Mao incorporates another county to his domain, and decides to create the Zhou of Chongchun, but it won't be the Zhou for long. Changing his capital to Changchun Zhou, because it's a little farther from his enemies in Tang, he now renames and reorganizes it into the People's Changchun, and of course he leaves his old capital to his son, Zheng Lun, in order to give him some leadership training. That's definitely needed. Mao decides to channel his inner Stalin, and raise his army as raiders to get some extra supplies to fund his campaigns. Deciding to target his much great enemy in the Kyrgyz Khanate, the Teddy Khan Duchy, taking some of their gold with some of his better troops. And he kind of makes a tour out of it, heading around in a circle south to attack many of the borders of the Kyrgyz Khanate that borders his domain, defeating any army, probably weaker, that stands in his way. The Kyrgyz seems to have seen a complete decline, as their force has been completely halved because of Mongolia, leaving the region in disarray. So, Mao decides to take advantage and attack Udogu to his north. As it's neighboring his capital of Changchun, he's able to march very quickly and hope to take it within a few months. However, the king of Shanxi declares a sudden war, trying to put a Tengri lord on the throne of Changchun. As his army is very far away in Tang, it will take some time for him to amass his army. Along with his other allies in the region, he seems to be somewhat of a threat. However, Mao has prepared this with his own allies, soon to take Urogu first, and then reorganizing his troops to head south to meet the Shanxi threat. With Urogu pacified, he starts to gather his forces and his allies, along with a few mercenaries, to prepare for what could be a very decisive war with a Tang vassal. With his army together at Changchun, Mao Zedong unifies his own force and prepares to march south. Initially, he is unsure where to go, perhaps the middle of his territory to prepare for an attack from either side, but instead decides to go to Xinhua in Beian, as it was his former capital and may be a target from the enemy force that he is just slightly outnumbered by. His second wife then gives birth to another son, giving Mao another option to include another ally, the Zhou of Fu Fang, in his defense of his territory. This puts him on a better playing field against his enemy of Shanxi. It's good timing too, because the Shanxi and their allies are coming in full force towards Beiyan, which Mao had predicted, allowing his army to meet them there. However, the Shanxi force decides to halt their attack on Beiyan and instead go to Guizhou, much like the Teddy Khan attack years prior. In the middle of this, Mao tries to meet them in Hiyashu, but the Fufang army comes to Chibinga. They are able to defeat the advanced force of Shanxi, but are attacked by the main force. Mao is able to come and attack the rear guard, and then finish off the Shanxi army that defeated Fufang, giving them a sizable victory in this war. The Shanxi force scatters, and Mao decides to follow up his attack and chase them in to Huabei. While his force catches up much faster than his allies, he seems to be at a slight disadvantage due to his supplies being low. However, Mao has confidence that his allies in the rear will be able to catch up, and he is correct, dealing another blow to the Shanxi army. The Shanxi army isn't able to get even a second of a break, as Mao decides to continue to chase their diminished forces through Huabei attacking them at Dingzhou and giving them another defeat. 
With this, they decide to march through the north, hoping to go through Manchuria, but Mao is still on their tail. They're able to escape to the sea and into Yingzhou and meet some naval forces, but because they just disembarked, they are too inferior. And with that, their victory is secured and Mao has protected against the Shanxi. With the Red Army's morale at an all-time high, Mao decides to take advantage of the even weaker Kyrgyz Khanate to seize their duchy of Teddy Khan, hoping to take all the territories bordering the people's Changchun in the future. In the meantime, Mao has another son, giving him the option to increase his alliances in the future. In a slightly more surprising turn of events, the Khitan Khanate has sent a raid party into the people's Changchun region, after a long years of alliance, it seems they have begun to fear the people's rise. During the long occupation of the Kyrgyz Khanate's territories and Teddy Khan, it seems Buyur has gotten its independence, giving Mao the option to turn and take their very weakened territory as well. Buyur puts up a good resistance, but unfortunately, the more talented Red Army is not easily defeated and begins to lay siege to their capital. Within a short few months, they take it, and Buyur has been incorporated into the people's Changchun. Around the same time, it seems the Kyrgyz Khanate has lost all influence in Teddy Khan, who has now become independent and immediately surrenders due to being occupied. Absolutely perfect. Yet Mao has reached an epiphany. The people's Changchun is too broad. It doesn't answer to the people themselves. In fact, it's not the people of Changchun, it's a Changchun Soviet, a community, Haje Soviet, the Teddy Khan Soviet, a more personable organization for the people. And the first act of this reformed communist utopia is to wage war against the ally turned enemy, the Khitan Khan, to liberate the people of Zarmoron from the authoritarianism of their rulers and bring about a new Soviet. The new revitalized Red Army of the Three Soviets quickly marches upon the Khitan army, defeating them in Longhua and following them down by taking that county for themselves. While the Khitan army retreats to their capital and off trying to take Bayan of all places. Very, very arrogant of them, Longhua has already fallen and the Red Army marches to finish off the Khitan army in Da Ding. And in this battle, the great Khitan falls and their leader captured like many others. And so the Zarmoron duchy is converted to the will of the people and becomes like all others, the Zarmoron Soviet. And with that, a new kingdom can be formed and it's not even truly a kingdom. In fact, it is better. It is the People's Republic of Manchuria bask in its glory as the people will finally find peace, happiness, and prosperity. And with the People's Republic of Manchuria, the leader is no supreme lord or lady. No, no, no. They are the Grand Secretary. Ah, Grand Secretary man or Grand Secretary woman. No sexual differences there. All the same. And so we have the Grand Secretary Mao Zedong of the People's Republic of Manchuria. Bask in the People's Throne Room as Mao leads the Republic to a true communist utopia. But that's where I'll call it for this episode. If you want to see more, make sure you leave a comment down below letting me know. And of course, smash that like button and all the other accessories down below if you support what I'm doing with CK3 and everything else that I make videos on. Sorry for the long wait again, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in, and I'll catch you all on the next one.